for coming here to the Catholic Information Center for the the uh, our event with Ross Douthat. And thank you for understanding. It was rescheduled, but it apparently didn't affect any of your schedule. So I'm very glad that you all made it. Um, Ross Douthat, the youngest op-ed columnist for the New York Times, has emerged as one of the most provocative and influential voices of his generation. In this book, Bad Religion, he offers a masterful and hard-hitting account of how American Christianity has gone off the rails and why it threatens to take American society with it. Writing for an era dominated by recession, gridlock, and fears of American decline, Ross exposes the spiritual roots of the nation's political and economic crises. He argues that America's problem isn't too much religion, as a growing chorus of atheists have argued, nor is it an intolerant secularism, as many on the Christian right believe. Rather, it's bad religion. The slow motion collapse of the traditional faith and the rise of a variety of pseudo-Christianities that stroke our egos, indulge our follies, and encourage our worst impulses. More on that coming from Ross himself, but I just wanted to say how pleased we are that we could have you all here and thank Ross for coming. And we're looking forward to, if you don't have this book already, I know it's received a lot of good press and you, you've you probably read about it, but if you don't own it yet, we must remedy that for you tonight. So join us afterwards for the book signing. And thank you again. Please join me in welcoming Ross Dothat. Well, thank you so much for that extremely kind introduction, and I'm somewhat less confident that my cancellation last time didn't disturb anybody's schedule, so I want to apologize for that. Um, what they don't tell you when they give you the Catholic handbook, and it includes the be fruitful and multiply instructions, is that being fruitful and multiplying also means contracting many strange diseases from the children that, that uh, you, you and your wife um, have the privilege to raise. And that's unfortunately what happened to me a couple of weeks ago. Over, over the last 16 months since my daughter was born, I've become acquainted with maladies that I didn't even know existed, um, but that parents are all intimately familiar with. So um, I I apologize again for not being here, and I'm glad you could all make it out tonight. Um, I thought that I would basically talk for about 15 or 20 minutes and just try and give a broad overview of some of the book's themes, talk about where the idea for the book came from, um, that sort of thing, and then we could just have a undoubtedly freewheeling and exciting uh, Q&A session. Um, and I'm always a bit nervous when I speak here with my with my back to the altar, but I'm reliably informed that there's an albino monk just behind that screen. <laughs> and if any of your questions cross any lines, well, I can't answer for what will happen. So, OK, good. That went over. All right. Um, <clears throat> so bad religion. Um, so the first question you get asked when you write a book like this is, well, where where did you get the idea to write a book like this? And what I usually say is that the idea uh, came to me somewhere in the second term of George W. Bush's presidency, when basically all the debates about um, religion and public life and everything else were dominated by a kind of sort of secular left versus Christian right framework where a lot of liberals became very concerned after the 2004 outcome that America was slouching towards some kind of theocracy. Um, and also then the broader debates that were s sort of kicked off, and I think related to that anxiety, uh, by the various new atheists, the late Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, and so forth. And it seemed like for a period there you couldn't turn on the television, or at least maybe the strange television channels that I tend to watch, without seeing Dawkins or Hitchens having their way with some hapless Christian academic bishop and so on. And if you happen to be on Nantucket on one unfortunate evening uh, in 2006 or so, you could have seen Hitchens wiping the floor with me, in fact, in a debate, one of a not heaven's best night um, that evening. But so, so that was sort of what was percolating in, in the religious atmosphere. Um, and I felt at the time I participated in some of these debates and in my capacity as a journalist and pundit, uh, but I also felt like they were missing a huge part of the story of religion in America. Um, and I felt like there was just this sort of broad swath of our religious life that touched on these sort of right versus left, secular versus religious uh, issues, but wasn't sort of, um, it, it wasn't covered completely by that uh, framework. And so I set out to write a book that would be, again, sort of touch on culture war issues, right versus left, and so on, but would also try and look at what's happening, I think, in the broad swath of America that 
uh, as I say in the book, I think something like, you know, where nobody's reading either Christopher Hitchens or the Pope's latest encyclical. Um, and so the book tries to focus in its second half a lot on what people sometimes dismiss as pop spirituality in, in its various manifestations. And so I spend a fair amount of time writing about figures ranging from, well, Dan Brown um, <laughs> to, to Elizabeth Gilbert, the author of Eat, Pray, Love, to Joel Osteen, to Oprah Winfrey, uh, and so on across the board. And my argument is basically that America over the last 50 years has become less traditionally Christian without necessarily becoming less religious. And the era that we're living through now is an era in which the traditional Christian institutions, uh, Catholic and Protestant alike, are in steep decline. And younger Americans especially are less likely than any previous generation to identify with a particular Christian denomination or tradition. And yet if you drill down below the surface of are you a Methodist or a Baptist or a Catholic um, and ask people, well, but do you believe in some sort of higher order in the universe? Uh, do you pray? Do you believe in an afterlife and so on? And certainly have you had a personal encounter with God? By some of those measurements, America is more religious today uh, than, it, than it was a, a few generations ago. And so the argument in the book is that basically um, – we are neither a traditionally Christian nation nor, I think, necessarily a post-Christian nation in a kind of complete sense, and certainly not, I think, a truly pagan nation, as uh, some conservatives even more pessimistic than myself occasionally suggest. And I think it's better to see the United States today as a country that has drifted away from the institutional Christian churches, but is still deeply influenced by Christian ideas, still intensely fascinated by the person of Jesus of Nazareth, and still very interested in sort of taking some portion of Christianity and refashioning it, adapting it, and so on to suit um, present trends, present beliefs, present needs. And so the word that I use to describe this landscape is heresy, which is obviously a provocative word, maybe less provocative in this room than in some forums <laughs> where I've addressed this issue. Um, actually, the, the amazing thing about promoting this book has been the primary sort of two places where I've talked about it probably have been NPR affiliates and uh, Christian radio stations. And it's very dangerous when you're sort of going back and forth between these two audiences <laughs> if you forget which one, which, which kind of audience you're addressing and you might slip up and anyway. Um, but so, right, so, so I use the word heresy and I'm trying to paint with something of a broad brush. Um, so my, I'm talking about a kind of, when I contrast heresy with Christian orthodoxy, I'm talking more about a kind of small o orthodoxy that's common to Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, and at least certain Protestant denominations rather than um, a sort of more specifically Catholic definition of the term. Um, but I am basically making an argument that it is, it is possible to see a genuine sort of core to Christian faith that goes back to the early councils of the church, the first three centuries of the faith, and so on. And it's also possible to sort of define certain features that are essential to that core. And um, my primary definition, which is pillaged, of course, from all kinds of authors more intelligent than myself, is the idea that Christian orthodoxy is, I think, almost uniquely among world religions comfortable with paradox and mystery. Um, and with the idea of a sort of both and approach to religious questions rather than either or. And you can see this certainly in some of the dogmatic definitions uh, ranging from the identity of Jesus himself, the sort of God-man issue, the Trinitarian issues and so on. But I think this also plays out in Christian attitudes towards you know, everything from how, how Christians should be engaged in politics and in the affairs of this world to the endless debates about the relationship between grace and free will and so on. So re really, I think you can, find, you can find this commitment to paradox and mystery both in the moral and the dogmatic aspects of the faith. And I think what the nature of heresy then is that it tends to take, it tends to uh, in, in many cases sort of seek a more logical or sort of mo at least more straightforward synthesis than Christian orthodoxy. So it takes one aspect of a synthesis, one aspect of a paradox or mystery, and emphasizes it to the exclusion of 
um, those aspects of Christian teaching that I think provide a kind of balance. So to take an obvious example that I, I use in the book, if you look at something like the prosperity gospel, which I think is an enormously influential, and I think its influence is often underrated um, aspect of American Christianity today, the prosperity gospel starts with an eminently Christian idea, right, which is that God desires human flourishing, human happiness, and so forth. Um, but it focuses on that idea to the exclusion of the other side of the Christian message, right, which is the idea of the cross, the idea that, um, that true human happiness may not be exactly coterminous with having the big house that you want and the big car that you want and the raise that you want and so forth. Um, so if you listen to, and I sort of make this contrast in the book, but if you compare a figure like Billy Graham, for instance, to a figure like Joel Osteen today, these are two figures who in certain ways have a lot in common. They're both popular evangelists. They both are capable of selling out baseball stadiums. They're both, um, you know, sort of global media personalities. And they both preach a message of God's universal love, right? There are parts of, not parts, uh, almost the whole of Joel Osteen's message is a message that you could expect to hear from Billy Graham at a crusade in 1957 or 1965 and so on. But Graham was always or almost always very effective at striking a balance where on the one hand he was this incredibly open-handed, often very ecumenical preacher of God's universal love, but he was also a preacher who placed an incredibly heavy emphasis on original sin, on human depravity, on the need for repentance and so on. And that part of the message, that half of the synthesis, that part of the paradox, if you will, is almost entirely absent from a figure like Osteen today. Um, so that's basically the sort of theological aspects of the argument I'm making, that we have certainly always been a nation of heretics in the United States. We've all, always been a nation where institutional churches are sort of in tension with, in conflict with spiritual freelancers, startup religious sects, and so on. But what is distinctive about our own era is that the um, we're, we, we're entering an era, I think, or we have entered an era in which heresy more and more has the field to itself, and that the often fruitful tension between orthodoxy and heresy, institutions and freelancers, tradition and do-it-yourself religion in American history, that tension is being lost as the institutional churches weaken. Um, and so let me just, I'm sort of going back to front in the book a bit here, um, but I'll go, I'll go to the front now and sort of talk just briefly about why I think the institutional churches have weakened over the last few generations, because obviously that's um, from, from the point of view of would-be Orthodox Christians themselves, that's a fairly important question. So the book starts in the 1940s and 50s with the post-war revival in American life, and it highlights what I think are a number of very positive aspects of that particular era. Um, one is the extent to which it was a period when sort of mass enthusiasm, rising levels of church going, new church construction, and greater piety and popular culture and so on, when that can coexisted with a real burst of intellectual and artistic creativity, um, whether it was represented by theologians like Reinhold Niebuhr or figures like Flannery O'Connor and you know the various novelists and poets who made up the Catholic Renaissance in that era. So you had this sort of healthy highbrow, lowbrow, or highbrow, middlebrow um, sort of dual track growth uh, for Christianity. You had a period when I think the Christian engagement with politics was healthier and more effective than it is today. Um, I think the way that the civil rights movement played out and the extent to which uh, Christian leaders were able to use um, sort of Christian moral arguments on political issues in ways that were transcended partisanship rather than becoming captive to one party or another was quite distinctive. It was fairly temporary, but it makes a contrast, I think, with the way these debates have played out on both the religious left and the religious right. Um, ever since. And then more generally, I think it was just, it was an era in which there was a real and, and healthy, uh, not a sort of shallow convergence, but a healthy, theologically serious convergence between a Catholicism that was 
in some ways assimilating to the American mainstream, but without losing any its essential identity, and that was producing a wave of very serious thought about the relationship between Catholicism and liberal democracy. Um, so you had that happening in Catholicism. You had mainline Protestantism in its what was known as its sort of neo-Orthodox phase, right, where there was a, at least a partial revolt against Protestant modernism, the sort of liberal theology of the early part of the 20th century, and in figures like Niebuhr and others, a more serious focus on original sin in particular, and sort of what I think Karl Barth called a return to the strange world of the Bible. And as this was happening in the main line, you had a sort of similar move towards a kind of Christian center from evangelicals who sort of tiptoed out of the kind of fundamentalist ghetto that a lot of American evangelicalism had wandered into in the 20s and 30s and became, um, you know, as there was neo-orthodoxy in mainline Protestantism, there was what was known as neo-evangelicalism um, embodied by figures like Graham, but also magazines like Christianity Today and so on that at least tried to engage American culture and other branches of American Christendom um, in a spirit of confidence and dialogue and so on, rather than a more cramped sectarianism. And then, obviously, you had the emergence of the black church from its historical marginalization to become sort of, at least temporarily, a really central witness to Christianity's presence in the world. So uh, the point I try and make in the book is not that this was a perfect golden age and that we need to get in our time machine, our DeLorean or what have you, and travel back to 1957, but that there were that Christianity's role in American culture overall was healthier, that Christian institutions were stronger, and that there are things that we can learn from that era as we think about our present situation. And as to how we got from, uh, from there to here, I, you know, there are a lot of factors, but I cite what I think are four big ones um, in sort of the middle section of the book. Uh, the first, uh, which I've sort of gestured at in mentioning the shift from the civil rights movement today is just the impact of political polarization um, and the extent to which it has become increasingly difficult uh, for Christians of any political convictions really to find a place to stand in American political debates where their faith isn't defined by their partisanship rather than the other way around. And I think this happened first on the religious left in the 60s and 70s where there was a real attempt to sort of keep Christianity relevant by focusing primarily on social justice, social reform, and so on. But it reached a point where it was effectively emptying out the Christian message and people said, well, you know, if the point of Christianity is to vote for democratic politicians um, and give money to left-wing causes, then why should I get up in the morning and mouth creeds I don't believe in? I'll either stop going to church or I'll leave this church for often an evangelical church that offers a more serious approach to piety. So that happened first to the religious left, but then you can see something similar happening to the religious right over the last 10 or 15 years where in opinion polls you see a widespread sense that Christian conservatives are just the Republican Party at prayer, and people will say, well, if I, I, if I don't agree with Sarah Palin or George W. Bush, uh, then I must not agree with Christianity. And this has become one of the largest stumbling blocks to the Christian message, I think, particularly among the younger generation. So polarization has a kind of a real logic of its own, where it becomes harder and harder to, for instance, be a pro-life Democrat, right? If you look at the 1970s and the politics of that era, it was possible to imagine that the anti-abortion cause would be, in some sense, a bipartisan cause, as the civil rights movement had been. You had figures like Teddy Kennedy writing letters to constituents expressing pro-life sentiments. You had Jesse Jackson worrying about abortion's impact on the black community. Um, and that has almost all disappeared, and it's disappeared, I think, not because all pro-life Democrats were daves and fools and so on, but just because the pressure of polarization is such a powerful thing, and it becomes, it's just very hard to sort of perpetually sort of identify against the political coalition to which you belong to, and you can cite similar examples on the political right. So. Polarization is one factor. The sexual revolution is another. I don't think I need to say actually that much about it because I think it's pretty obvious the challenge that um, the birth control pill and then sort of broader trends in sort of premarital sexuality, divorce, and so on down to the debates about gay marriage in our own day, all of that created a widespread sense that even if you liked Christianity in some general sense, its sexual ethics seemed to be out of date, um, not something that was realistic to follow. And again, 
particularly for younger Americans, as the gap between sort of coming into sexual maturity and getting married gets wider and wider over the last few decades, it creates this huge space where the Christian sexual ethic seems just totally irrelevant, I think, to a lot of people. And I think neither liberal Christians, who's at, whose tendency was to just sort of jettison the harder stuff, nor conservative Christians who've tried to maintain it, have found a way to sort of you know, make that message sort of broadly compelling in our culture. So you have sex and then you have money. Um, I think in a, in a similar way to the consequences of the sexual revolution, I think the consequences of America's ever-growing extraordinary wealth um, from the post-war era on make the New Testament suspicion of wealth seem not necessarily less persuasive, but less relevant, again, than it had been in previous generations, and particularly to a generation that had come of age with the hardship and privation of the Great Depression and the Second World War. Um, and this manifests itself in a lot of ways. I already talked about the prosperity gospel, but one more specific and, and also more Catholic-specific example that I cite is just the impact on vocations to the priesthood and also to the ministry for, for Protestants. I think the sexual aspect of the decline in vocations gets almost all of the press, right? The idea that, you know, a, a, a life, you know, without marriage, without sex and so on seemed less appealing to young men after the 1960s. I think people have that sense in general. But I think the interesting thing is what, what happens too is that, you know, the priesthood is a calling, a vocation, but in American terms, it's also a profession, right? It's something that people enter into often as something, you know, it's, it's, it's an alternative to being a doctor or a lawyer or, God help you, a journalist. Um, and the gap between the kind of material rewards available to people entering the priesthood, people entering the ministry and so on, and people who became doctors and lawyers, that gap was there in the 40s and 50s. Obviously, becoming a priest or a minister always involved a certain amount of social and material sacrifice. But the gap gets much, much, much larger over the last few decades. And you see this corresponding decline in things like, you know, what percentage of Phi Beta Kappa students end up going to divinity schools? Just these sort of measurements of the human capital that's available to both the Catholic Church and the mainstream Protestant denominations. And then it, by the same token, the, the churches that have find it easier to attract people to the ministry are churches where there's more of a sort of superstar pastor mentality, right? Where you're sort of marrying a pastorship to a sort of entrepreneurial side of things, and the goal is to build your mega church and build your brand and so on. And so those churches flourish, but obviously those ministers are exposed to set of temptations of their own. So I think money in large ways and small um, has a really corrosive impact on the institutional life of the church. And then the final factor that I talk about, and I think we can move from here to Q&A and discussion, but is the sort of um, intertwining influence of globalization and decolonization. So you have this period in American life where, thanks to everything from television, the spread of television to the Vietnam War, the diversity of the world is beamed into Americans' living rooms as really never before. Uh, and at the same, and this coincides with this long period of decolonization, um, where you have a, I think, justifiable backlash against imperialism and a sense of guilt over often the ends to which Christianity was turned in the 15th through the 19th century. Um, and and you and this, I think, goes a long way towards explaining the broader trend towards theological relativism in the West in general, but in America, in particular, where people who are sort of exposed to the dizzying diversity of the world and exposed to a feeling of guilt about Christ, what, what Christians did in the name of Christianity in Africa or Latin America or wherever are more likely to say not, I no longer believe in God, but I no longer think that my one church can possibly have a monopoly on the truth. Um, and the irony of the situation, of course, is that this same period, this same experience of decolonization and all the rest, was a tremendous boon to Christianity in the areas that were actually experiencing decolonization, because as Christianity was less associated with European rule, less of a defined as a white man's religion and so on, it became more appealing, and you saw you know, the growth of Christianity in Africa and Asia as well post-1950, 1960, compared to the period when the European countries were ruling those areas is, is staggering. So you have this fascinating divergence between 
the West, which has a feeling of guilt that leads to a feeling of relativism, and the rest of the world, which has a feeling of, you know, where Christianity suddenly seems fresher and more compelling. Uh, but from, from our point of view, from the point of view of the United States, the important trend, I think, is the trend towards a greater sort of mix of theological relativism and guilt over the, over the sins of the Christian past. So there are other factors, certainly, but that's sort of my broad sketch of, um, of how we got here and some of the forces undercutting small o orthodoxy and uh, um, boosting heresy's appeal. Um, and so there I think I'll just throw the floor open to questions and we can we can have a conversation about some of these issues. So shall I just, I'll just call on people? I, d I don't know what I'm, but, but yes. So sir, you had your hand up very quickly. So you'll reap the dubious reward. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned Flannery O'Connor as a sort of, uh, maybe a high point of sorts uh, in the 1950s for religion. And I wonder if you think that she would portray religion in the 1950s as sort of a high point. If she were alive today or if we took our DeLorean back to the 1950s. Because if she were alive today, she would agree with me in every particular. That's the, <laughs> that's the amazing thing. No, I think, I, think, I think it's a very good question because obviously, yeah, if you go back and read a lot of the, not just O'Connor, but a lot of the very serious religious writers of that era, there was a sense then as now that, you know, Christianity, you know, that there was a secular culture, you know, that the, the intellectual climate of the West was hostile to Christian belief, that academic life, literary life, and, and so on was hostile to Christian belief. And I think this is, the, this is the question that's always raised, right, about sort of declinist narratives, which is that there's, in every era, there are declinist narratives. And so you have to be very careful about assuming that, you know, your decline is more real than the decline people felt um, 50 years ago. That being said, I think it also has to be possible to sort of, you know, step back and say, whatever the particular challenges, and they were significant, facing Christians in intellectual life circa 1952, facing, you know, Christians in other ways in that era, there is, I think, a real contrast too between the way that the the way that Christians engaged the culture in that era and the way Christians felt about the culture in that era and the way um, we we tend to feel today. And it isn't just as simple a matter as of the fact that you know Time Magazine used to put C.S. Lewis and Reinhold Niebuhr and so on on John Courtney Murray and others on its cover. And it's hard to imagine that happening today. But I do think things like that are signifiers. And if you go back and read, I start my chapter on the 1940s and 50s, that post-war moment with, not with a, a precisely an American, but with, with, with Auden, um, the, the W.H. Auden, the poet, who's, you know, a sort of British expat who, who comes to the United States um, and, and um, reconverts, reverts, I guess you'd say, to the Christianity of his childhood at that point. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just, I mean, I'm a journalist. I work in this sort of intersecting fields of, um, you know, politics and intellectual culture. And it's very hard to go back and read both what Auden wrote about Christianity, but also sort of the places he wrote about it, the, you know, writing in the New Republic, the things he wrote, and just sort of the way, the way that um, Christianity was viewed at that moment and not see a shift to the way it's viewed today. Um, they're just you know, I mean, some of it is just certain issues hadn't come up, right? So Auden's homosexuality was not a huge flashpoint in the culture wars and was not one of the primary reasons that many people were asserting for rejecting Christianity, right? So so he, so it plays, a, his homosexuality plays a very different role in his relationship to Christian faith. Um, and I think a, from you know, a, a less problematic role or at least a less challenging role than does the homosexuality of, let's say, an, an Andrew Sullivan to pick a sort of prominent religious, you know, gay writer today. Um, and I mean, that's sort of a small example, but I think you can track those kind of shifts in a lot of ways. And I think what I find, and again, this is just private judgment, but what I find going back to that era is just a real sense, yes, that Christianity was embattled and that lar large segments of Western culture were hostile to it, but also a sense, a sense of sort of confidence as well, a sense that after the experience of the 1930s, after the experience of World War II, after the 
obvious or increasingly obvious failures of these sort of alternatives to religion, both communist and fascist, the sort of totalizing ideologies, that there, there was a real sort of Christian moment. And it wasn't just happening in a ghetto, right? It wasn't just sort of, well, we're, people were saying, well, we're rebuilding our small Christian communities here or there. It was happening in Time magazine. It was happening in, you know, major newspapers. It was, it was happening in the popular culture. It was happening in the movies that Hollywood was making and the novels that people were reading and so on. So, so yes, yes to the idea that there isn't a golden age in the past that we can return to, and yes to the idea that um, you know Flannery O'Connor would have been very skeptical of the idea that she was living in a golden age. But that said, I do think things have changed in significant ways for the worse for Christians since then, and I think that's something we have to we have to recognize. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> It seems to me that in your taxonomy of the various kinds of Christian heresies, and there was a deep richness in the book just about how varied that landscape is. You're very kind. Invariably, people of the New Age variety, the spiritual but not religious people, who, who, who insist that they're explicitly rejecting Christianity. And it seems to me, I wonder if you think there's anything problematic in attributing a certain false consciousness to these people. Because you're kind of speaking to them in effect and encouraging them to say, to reconsider the notion that they have no debt to Christian heritage. You know, and I've been intrigued by your suggestions elsewhere in your interviews in the book that even to people like your average Roman feminist who says, you know, no, I just, I'm rebelling against everything Christianity stands for, whatever. Even for those people on the fringes of the landscape of heretics, that there remains something persistently comforting or somehow, I don't know, infuriatingly attractive about the Jesus narrative or some aspects of Christianity. And so I just wonder if you see some, if you, as you were kind of collecting these various narratives together, if you thought, are there something difficult about getting those people in? No, I, I, yes, the answer, the answer is, I, I think in the argument I'm making for using the term heresy is certainly more persuasive with some examples than with others, right? So I, I don't think there's any question that it is correct to describe Joel Osteen and Creflo Dollar um, and a lot of the people who appear on the Trinity Broadcasting Network as just straightforward Christian heretics, people who call themselves Christian but deviate in a really important way from certain core New Testament values. In the case of Elizabeth Gilbert, Right or um, Deepak Chopra and figures like that. It's it's definitely it's definitely more ambiguous, and I am I think stretching the term heresy at least for some of those figures to cover people who maybe have, you know, instead of this foot outside Christianity, it's you know it's more like it's more like that. So I so yes, and that that is a sort of um, uh, you know any any thesis is going to have. <laughs> aspects that are completely compelling and aspects that are sort of stretching the thesis a little to make uh, what I do think is an important point, right, about the sort of persistent appeal of Christian ideas and Christian narratives even to people who don't define themselves as Christian. With that being said, I do think, too, that there is, right, I mean, someone like Chopra, right, certainly, yeah, if he were in this room tonight, he would probably object to the idea of yeah, being labeled a Christian heretic. He would say, well, I don't identify as Christian and so on. But Chopra can't stop writing about Jesus, right? And he can't stop, I mean, he's written two books about Jesus. He can't stop sort of claiming that Jesus agreed with him, repurposing the Jesus narrative and so on for, for his own purposes. And that's true of a lot of these writers, like at the climax of a book like The Celestine Prophecy, right? Which, you know, is, is it, is it a, a sort of Christian heresy in the sense that, um, let's say, you know, the, the Arians were Christian heretics? Well, no, it's clearly further from the core of Christian faith. And yet, but at the end of the book, Redfield has his characters say, well, all we've learned here, you know, is just the stuff that Jesus learned before. And, you know, we're following in his path and he's one of the ultimate spiritual masters and so on. And this, that idea comes up again and again in perhaps not in the sort of most radical Wiccan feminist spiritual narratives, but in, I think, narratives that are immensely powerful in American life today. And I think there is real value in pointing that out, both to the people themselves, but also, I think, to, um, to Christians who are more likely to say, well, you know, 
we've we've sort of lost you know we've lost the culture in in those areas and it's repaganized or it's explicitly post-christian and so on. I was hoping to answer my own question too. I thought maybe there was some connection between the God within theology and the mystery of incarnation. That it is sort of the mystery of the something huge to take for granted that the divine should be readily available to the individual to experience in such an immediate way. And that there's, I think, some connection there. I, I, I think so as well, but I mean, I'm, I'm biased, right? I, I mean, the, I, I guess one, the, uh, 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 not quite the same, but sort of similar example that, that I sometimes like to cite, not I think in the book, is just the extent to which the, if you read the New Atheists, right, the argument, um, the sort of theodicy argument, right, the argument that, you know, God seems indifferent to human suffering and so on is one of the most powerful and most frequently resorted to arguments in that oeuvre. And there, I definitely think it's the case that it's the shadow of the mystery of the incarnation, if you will, that creates this, this intellectual bias that, well, if there is a God, he should care about our suffering, and therefore we, you know, we suffer, you know, seemingly senselessly, so we can reject the concept of God and so on. And obviously, the theodicy argument is older than Christianity. It's, you know, it's not just in the Old Testament, but it's pre present in paganism and philosophy and so on. But I do think that the Christian story is that the the argument against Christianity on the, you know, why does a good God allow evil to endure? That that argument is. It's, it's paradoxically strengthened by, it's sort of nourished by the Christian conception of God. And I think, and I can't back this claim up, but I think it has, it probably has more purchase as an argument for atheism in the Christian or semi-Christian West than it would necessarily in other cultural contexts. Now maybe there are, you know, Hindus or Buddhists or Muslims who would, you know, who would, who would disagree. And I, I could be wrong about this, but I, I do think that that's, that's an example of the extent to which it's you know it's it's hard for people to escape from their from their cultural matrix, but also from these incredibly powerful religious ideas that uh, define our culture to this day. Now, as to whether that's an effective argumentative tool, if you're trying to persuade people to reconsider Christianity, that I don't know, and it's totally possible. You know, I think I've had both reactions in these kind of arguments of people saying, well, that's really interesting, but also people saying, yeah, well, what, you're just attributing false consciousness to me. This is sort of like a weird Marxist version of Christianity or something. So so I don't, I, I'm not at all certain that this is some brilliant new apologetic strategy that I've that I've pioneered. It may it may not be, but I I think that the underlying point is a true one, whether it's sort of rhetorically effective um, necessarily or not. So, um, yes, sir. Uh, I have a quick question. To what extent do you think that bad religion or heresy is sort of, of a corollary or even an outgrowth of liberal democracy? And I, in mind here, I have David Schindler's critique of liberalism. I'm wondering if you probe that at all. I, I don't really, in part, and again, in part because I'm sort of, you know, there are limits to how wide the canvas can be. I, I've gotten into it actually a little bit. I did a sort of long back and forth with um, a writer named William Salatan, who writes for Slate, who many of you may read. Um, and at the end of it, you know, inevitably the dialogue just became him asking me to defend Christian sexual teaching, which is sort of how these dialogues always end up. So I, I ended it, I ended it, I, I ended the dialogue with sort of a last flourish where I said, well, you know, who are you to judge me? Your liberalism is, your secular liberalism is just a, you know, intellectually inconsistent Christian heresy that's less compelling even than the God within or something. So that was my, and that, I, I still have some more, uh, you know, it opened into a sort of blog debate, and I still have some more posts to write in that vein. I, I, I mean, I, I, so I am definitely sympathetic to the idea that, um, in some ways, you can see sort of mod the liberalism of, uh, let's say, of John Locke and the American founding and so on as itself a form of Christian heresy. I think it is an example in a way of a point I make early in the book, which is that heresy can be very good for Christianity, right? And that the sort of this, the, the liberal critique of the relationship between throne and altar and so on and the extent to which Christians sort of tolerated institutional cruelty and sort of unnecessary hierarchy and so on, that was, that was an important critique for Christianity to wrestle with. And I think Christianity in the, in the 19th century was 
in many ways intellectually healthier than Christianity in the 18th century precisely because of that sort of encounter with um, with 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 liberalism. So, but as to what that means for the American experiment, I mean, I do. You know, there's I. I I guess I'll I'll plead uncertainty and agnosticism on the you know Schindler versus Richard John Newhouse debates. Um, I sort of sort of toggle back between those two sides about the extent to which we should see the American experiment as in continuity with um, you know medieval and early modern Christian political philosophy, and to what extent it represents a break. I do think that there is clearly a tendency within liberalism, though, that where that you know, Tocqueville writes about and that is sort of part of what I'm writing about in the book, right, where it is just this this tendency towards individualism in the broadest sense, but sort of clearly specifically religious individualism as well. And I think one of the questions that's been raised about my argument is that, yeah, I mean, isn't this just, right, isn't what I'm describing just the working out of certain inevitable features of liberal modernity? Um, and so the sort of past health of Christian institutions was just sort of a temporary holdover from the Christian past, and now we're sort of headed irrevocably towards a more do-it-yourself future. And I, I concede that that is a possibility. So, sir. Thanks. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this, and I hesitate sometimes to bring up things which the author didn't actually mention, but one of the Please causes... <laughs> I didn't mention many important things. <laughs> sure. Um, you didn't mention as a cause of the bad religion problem that we face that increasing intertwinement of government and religion, and the interdependence, particularly religion's dependence upon government. Um, much of what we do is funded by government. And um, John Allen, who writes for the National Catholic Reporter, had a way of phrasing it where he said that if you want Christianity to thrive, it really has to be independent. Um, do you see that as being a significant cause of where we're at, or is it really more a good thing? It's it's a good question and it's one I don't really raise in the book. I'm more I do write a fair amount about politics, but as I suggested, I'm a little more focused on sort of the extent to which religious ideas have become captive to sort of ideological and partisan coalitions, rather than focusing on the institutional side of things and the extent to which, you know, the the extent to which the growth of the state in general tends to co-opt or sort of preempt sort of religious community, right? Um, and I think one one reason I, I, I actually raised that issue a little bit in the prosperity gospel chapter where I'm drawing a, a contrast between the United States and Europe, because I do think it's clear that, or fairly clear at least, that one of the reasons that, you know, even in its, even its contemporary badness notwithstanding, religion has flourished more in the last 40 or 50 years in the U.S. than in Europe is precisely because we hear we, our churches are less likely to be intertwined with and less likely to be co-opted by um, government bureaucracy, the welfare state, and so on, just because that, both because of the traditional separation of church and state and also because our bureaucracies are somewhat smaller. Um, but it, it uh, but I, I agree with you. I think it's a, it's, it's a significant issue, certainly in the present moment, given the debates about Catholic charities and everything else, and where, you know, you suddenly come up short and realize, well, how much, you know, how large a share of Catholic charities' budget comes from the government, and it's a huge share, um, and that obviously has relevance um, to, to, to some, some of the current debates over the HHS mandate and so on. But I, I guess I don't, what I don't know is whether it's, I think there's a conservative narrative that sort of straightforwardly blames the state for taking over, encroaching, co-opting, and so on. And I suppose I'm more likely to be drawn to the alternative narrative, which has the state sort of stepping in as religious institutions weaken. But obviously, the two forces intertwine. It isn't a coincidence, I'm sure, that the period of decline that I talk about coincides with the launch of the Great Society and this big, you know, this big moment when sort of liberal believers were convinced that, you know, they that that relationship was a really healthy one that needed to be further um, furthered still. But I am, I suppose, enough of a sympathizer to New Deal era Catholicism to be skeptical of the sort of straightforwardly Catholic libertarian position that says that, you know, well, every step along this path has, has been a, been a mistake. Um, but, you know, 
yeah, so that's that's a non-answer, but I think it's a very important issue. So, uh, yes, ma'am. Given the polarization you're talking about, what kind of grade would you give the bishop's effort to navigate this treacherous landscape with the HHS debate and everything they have to deal with? I think in the HHS debate in, in particular, they've, they've done quite well. Um, I think the challenge for the bishops over the last few months has been basically to sort of demonstrate that they speak for a larger swath of the American church than just themselves. And the st entire strategy of the Obama White House, I don't think the Obama White House had a strategy initially. I think this was something they just blundered into. But once they did blunder into it, I think the strategy has been to craft a compromise that would essentially sort of peel off enough of institutional Catholicism in the United States to effectively isolate the bishops and say, well, look, they don't speak for the church, they speak for themselves. And so I think the fact that, um, you know, various affiliates of Catholic charities and so on, but especially an institution like Notre Dame joined in, joined in the lawsuits is a testament to at least the relative political skill of the bishops. And what people who are more plugged into these issues will say to me is that you also have to... Uh, you know, you have to grade on a curve a little bit. You have to recognize just how remarkable it is that the bishops have been able to present this this united affront. And I think those of us who don't spend a lot of time focusing on sort of the internal politics of the bishops' conference and so on might underestimate just how significant that that united front has been. On the broader question, I mean, it's just what you know, what balance you want the bishops to strike on sort of you know, talking about abortion and homosexuality and gay marriage and so on versus talking about social justice issues. I, you know, I, I don't know, I don't have a, a brilliant answer. I think both as, as a political conservative, I have a sort of, you know, um, negative reaction to the style that the bishops took in the 1980s, which often seemed to be to say, well, the Catholic Church supports the Democratic Party, not abortion, but we support the Democratic Party, not abortion. You know, so I, I have a sort of negative reaction to that. But at the same time, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it is important for the bishops to sort of, you know, there there is a big role here for the laity to play, and it's important for the bishops to step back on a lot of issues and let lay politicians fight it out. But I'm not totally sold on the idea. I think George Weigel made this argument in a piece for First Things, basically, that the bishops really should be just narrowly, fo not narrowly, but, but sort of really particularly focused on, um, you know, on issues of intrinsic evils and sort of leave other political issues aside entirely, because I, I think that that, just in terms of Catholicism's public witness, you just get into that Republican Party at prayer problem. Um, and I think the bishops need a public language of some kind on social justice issues that isn't just, you know, that, that makes it clear that Catholicism is bigger than the Republican Party. Um, but it's a real challenge, and I don't, again, have sort of perfect talking points. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I was just wondering, I mean, in, in all this talk, it kind of characterized this is in some ways a decline narrative. What what future or what I guess what is it sort of like what what can we what can we do or what, what do you see the future of traditional or you know, broadly speaking, Orthodox Christianity in the United States? What what's what are the possibilities here to take away? What? So I, I use the conclusion to sketch out a, a few different models that I think um, that I, I think different Christians are taking, um, and ranging from what the the uh, journalist Rod Dreher, borrowing from Alasdair McIntyre, has called the Benedict Option, right, which I think is basically the idea that sort of conservative believers should, in a sense, retreat into their own communities, focus on having large families, building agrarian utopias, reading Wendell Berry, and reconquering the United States after a pitched battle with Mormons, Orthodox Jews, and Neo-Calvinists in 2057. Um, now, that's an attractive model. Um, no, but, but so, so there's, there's that model. Um, then there's, I think, uh, the sort of models that you see that are, um, I think, often popular with younger evangelicals, which are sort of attempts to craft a kind of a, a kind of cultural engagement that ranges from, 
um, the sort of intellectual school of radical orthodoxy to the sort of more, somewhat more theologically liberal sort of emergent church movement that becomes very theologically liberal in some cases. Um, but, but basically, I think there's sort of a, the big dilemma is to what extent should Christians look on American culture as sort of, uh, look on some of these debates as sort of lost causes and f sort of focus on tending their own vineyards, rebuilding up their own institutions, and so on. And again, I'm very torn on these issues because on the one hand, I think the most important thing for Christians is to find ways to model Christianity, right, in ways that don't seem to be captive to or dominated by partisan causes, um, sort of political goals, and all the rest. And I conclude the book with a, a quote from... Um, the current pope, but before he was before he was the pope, about how to the effect that the you know the only really credible witnesses to Christianity are the lives of the saints and the beauty of Christian art. Or I'm, I'm paraphrasing, and I think that that there is in that quote a real message for Christians who've been really focused on political and culture war battles, right? Which is that ultimately um, those battles are not going to be won in the political arena, and um, sometimes they're going to be won by you know sort of not shouting at people, but sort of modeling something to people. Um, and so that's that's sort of the case in a way for partial disengagement. But the problem is, well, there are a couple problems, but one problem is obviously first you partially engage and then disengage, and then Kathleen Sebelius knocks on your door and says, I'm closing your hospital. And yeah, I mean, you know, so, so you can't, in sort of an immediate sense, there are problems with disengagement. But then in a broader sense, one of the theses of my book is that America isn't really post-Christian, right? And that as, as Catholics, we share a huge 70 million member church with people who are, you know, lapsed or, you know, rarely attending mass, but are one confession away from, you know, being, um, you know, Catholics in good standing has a legalistic, fr but you, you, know, you know what I mean. And similarly, from, you know, a Protestant perspective, um, there you don't even you don't even need the confessional, right? <laughs> so, um, so it's just it it seems to me very very dangerous as well to sort of you know to say well we've got our own you know we've got our institutions and we don't need Georgetown because we've got Christendom College and you know we don't need the Jesuits because the Dominicans are reviving or something you know I mean whatever whatever narrative you want to take I mean I think I, I think you have to there there are perils and temptations associated with a sort of withdrawalism and, and, and a purism. And again, you know, to go back to your point about Flannery O'Connor, right? I mean, things have always been a mess and they're going to continue to be a mess and you can't just sort of use the mess as an excuse for withdrawing. So, um, which is to say that I, I don't, again, I don't have sort of a, a definite blueprint, but I think that there, there has to be a way to sort of, you know, make make Christianity more attractive in a fashion that's still engaged with the culture as a whole, and I think that's the, you know, that's that's the challenge for for all of us, I guess you could say, in this um, in in this arena. So, um, all right, this side, sir. Sure. So, where specifically uh, do you see hope of kind of a reversal of that degradation of individuals? Because you know, in the cultural political context. The church, the institutional Christianity, is seen as against the individual. Abortion, gay marriage, and every social issue we want to tackle for both sides. Is there something that exists in the American context now that kind of would give hope to the fact that these institutions, these institutions would still stand or can even thrive and flourish? I mean, I think what gives you hope is the fact that, and, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm try and make this case to a secular as well as a religious audience, but certainly from a Christian perspective, um, that a serious Christianity is ultimately more conducive to human flourishing um, than a sort of pure religious individualism or whatever else you want to um, you want to use to describe our current moment. And so that means that maybe not in the short run, but in the long run, um, there is at least the possibility of Christian witness, successful Christian witness, making making the church, uh, making churches uh, more appealing to people who are sort of adrift on the seas of individualism. And, you know, I think that there have been a number of moments from the fall of the Berlin Wall to 9-11 
to um, to the Great Recession and its consequences that have, I think, provided opportunities for sort of making the Christian case anew and for having some of the kind of cultural reassessment that I think there was in the wake of World War II. Um, and that hasn't really happened, I think, or it's happened in sort of partial, incomplete ways or you know, it, it will happen and then something like the sex abuse scandal will intervene and sort of undercut uh, Catholic witness in particular. But, I mean, you know, the, I spend a lot of time in the book sort of linking some of these spiritual and theological trends to what I think are very real social ills, um, ranging from sort of the broad decline in American community, the weakening of the American family to, um, you know, it's not that hard to see a connection between the rhetoric of the prosperity gospel and the way Americans approached real estate decisions in the last 10 years or so. And if, and you know, you can overdraw that point, right? They weren't reading Joel Osteen and Lehman Brothers and Goldman Sachs, presumably, or <laughs> maybe they were. Um, but, 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 but I think it is a real point, and there is a sense in which, uh, you know, the the Christian argument is not just here are our sort of five points for why Christianity is true. The Christian argument is also, you know, well, look at, look at how we live and look at how you live, um, which one of us is, seems to be closer to the truth about the universe. And I mean, that, you know, depending on which account of the first few centuries of Christianity you, you believe, that may have been one of the more compelling things about Christianity in a, you know, explicitly non-anti-Christian culture. And Maybe it's harder to make that case in a sort of semi-Christian, pseudo-Christian culture, but surely that case can still be made, right? And I mean, I don't think, you know, we should, we should be partial determinists in the sense that we need to recognize the deep structural trends going on in American life, but we shouldn't be complete determinists um, because Christian history is just, you know, it's 2,000 years worth of crisis followed by revival, followed by crisis, followed by revival. And the church has always depended on unexpected resurrections. Um, sorry, it's, what I, it's a line for the book, but I always say sort of a little cutesy. Um, but, but I mean, there isn't, you know, there, there isn't any, any necessary reason why we shouldn't hope for that in the future. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi. I haven't read the book yet. I just bought it just now. Well, now you don't need to read the book. So <laughs> that's the terrible thing about these talks. <laughs> but I'm wondering if you address it all. I'm, I'm curious, just listening to the debate going on, about the lines, fine or otherwise, between effective witness and marketing, and whether you think the consumer culture as the you know, slapping, annihilating ethos of everything in our society has contributed to dominant heresy, but um, I mean, I'm thinking specifically also about the corruption of the universities, which used to be, or at least thought to be, thought to be. great citadels of learning, where the learned professors, and you were basically lucky to be there. There was no suggestion that you were a consumer and that education was a product, that the professors were responsible for satisfying your consumer desires. And that's certainly the dominant ethos now of university culture. And it seems to be also in our faith life that if you don't like the particular teachings of your church, just go right on down the street, and maybe that guy will have your desired product. So I wonder if you touch on that, and if so or if not, where the line is between effective witness and where it degrades the kind of creepy, distributist approach to marketing. Well, I, d I don't know exactly where where the line is. I mean, I think you can see this problem. You know, Catholics are terrible at marketing, so we can see this problem more clearly among our evangelical brethren. Um, but but there, I think you know, you you what is the distinction between? So in the book, I invoke um, a figure like Tim Keller, the pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York, um, as sort of a successful model, I think, of a serious Christian who's sort of engaged with secular culture um, without sort of compromising, selling out, and so on. Um, and then I invoke a figure like Osteen as, as, a, as, a, as a negative example and as, I think, a sort of cautionary example of some of the trends you're discussing. Um, but, you know, I mean, obviously, Keller is something of a marketer, too. He's an entrepreneur. He's sort of built his church from a small seed to, you know, to to a, a tree with many branches or whatever metaphor you want. And, um, and you know, and any, any 
Christian missionary. There's all you know. There's always going to be an aspect of that. So it's it's a line that is very important to draw, but is also very difficult to draw. I, I mean, I think the, the broader point that I try to make is, and I think this is sort of particular to um, to Christians who are who are strongly defined as political conservatives, and and I think. Christians in that camp just have a really particular obligation to recognize the particular temptations associated with capitalist culture, consumerism, um, and so on. And the fact that you as a Christian and as a student of politics are really skeptical of state power and, you know, believe that coerced charity is not really charity and so on and a lot of things that I basically believe myself, the fact of those beliefs gives you a higher obligation to be a cultural critic, right? If you don't think that the federal government has, you know, should be sort of capping people's incomes and, you know, redistributing on a large scale and so on, that's that's fine. But you then have an obligation to speak out on a, on a moral level against the particular, you know, whether it's on Wall Street or and anywhere else, anywhere else, Main, you know, Wall Street, Main Street, wherever in the culture. Um, and that's something I think that it's it's very hard to do. And I think a lot of conservative Christians, understandably, spend a lot of time being focused, you know, sort of perpetually on the threat from the political left and, you know, the, the sort of threat of big government and so on. But what that means is that in their witness, they're, you know, they feel like they have to defend rich people because they, you know, don't want to be, you know, don't want to be embracing 70 percent, a return to 70 percent tax rates or something. And I think Christians have to, Christians who are political conservatives have to find a way to say, I'm not for 70 percent tax rates, um, but, you know, I'm, I'm also aware of the camel and the needle's eye and its relevance for contemporary society. So, um, how are we doing? Uh, sorry, where where am I? Where's my timekeeper? I don't want to keep you guys here again. Sorry. All right, let's do two. Uh, all right, we have four hands raised, so I'm going to go around and then I'll weave your questions into a brilliant answer that answers none of them. So quickly, <laughs> sir. Okay, two questions. Two, no, 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 no. Uh, one question, two parts. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I've wrongly been accused of romanticizing the 1950s, um, and. I meant perhaps you keep this in your book, but what, what might you speculate it was sown into the seabed of the 50s such that we go from Buddy Holly to Gene Simmons, you know, in, in under 20 years? I mean, people say that, you know, the 60s weren't a result of some spontaneous combustion, but that, you know, there had been something sown into the, the ground as that, such that when the 60s happened, we had the sexual revolution and such. So what might you speculate was in, involved in that? That's the whole. That is. The, what's the second part? <laughs> I don't. What's, I, what's the telos of your book? Like, what do you hope people will do if they oh, read it? Oh, okay. That's yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, s s yes. So, yeah. Uh, what impact would you say that evolving the science and technology had on the trends you described in the book? Michael. I was curious as to kind of how Catholicism kind of fits within your historical narrative. And I agree. In 1957. Christianity enjoyed a lot of influence in kind of mainstream culture, but Catholicism really did. And since that time, I think Catholicism has enjoyed uh, some more influence broadly, but perhaps less influence on the Sony adherents. I was kind of just wondering through how they can fit in your historical narrative. Okay, and there was one over here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, uh, well, you're back to Flannery O'Connor. Uh, Walker Percy at the end of his life was asked, you know, if your friend Flannery popped up today, what would most surprise her? And he said, instantly. The collapse of the nuns. Feminism destroyed. You talk about that. Okay. What have I done? All right. So I think Catholicism was quite culturally influential in the 1950s. Um, and I think that this, you know, I talk a lot about sort of obvious things like uh, Fulton Sheen and his broadcasts and how pretty unimaginable it would be today to have a Catholic bishop in full pre-Vatican II regalia delivering a sort of, you know, the sort of, as the Oprah Winfrey of his day, but a much more theologically serious Oprah Winfrey. But I think, you know, if you look across the range of popular culture in that era, if you were a visitor from Mars and you just came to the United States and watched a bunch of movies and, um, you know, and said, well, what's the dominant religion in the United States? 
you would have said Roman Catholicism. I mean, just, you know, from World War II movies about, you know, the fighting Sullivans to Bing Crosby and Spencer Tracy playing priests and so on. I think Catholicism was still, in certain ways, intellectually ghettoized. There was still a real academic Protestant sort of suspicion um, of, of the church. But I think if you go back I don't know, you read like Martin Marty, the great historian of American Protestantism. He starts writing in the 50s and he's talking about sort of all this Protestant anxiety that somehow Catholicism had just become, you know, people, newspaper columnists who weren't Catholic would talk about our bishop, you know, and our this and our that. So I think it's, I, 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 I agree that in certain ways, sort of post 1960s, sort of post Vatican II Catholicism did have more intellectual and political influence in some specific ways. But I don't know if there's ever been an era in American life when Catholic social teaching seemed as seamlessly integrated into the political majority as in the, you know, the sort of New Deal, you know, labor, labor liberalism of the 40s and 50s. So I think it's, I, I, I think in general, there was a really potent Catholic presence in American culture. Now, go back to 1912, and yes, I think Catholicism was extremely marginal, but I think that's what's interesting about the post-war era is how unmarginal Catholicism has become. Now, this segues to your question, and there I think, because I'm a sort of, you know, defender of, hopefully not uncritically, that, that period, um, I, I don't think necessarily, you, you do read people who argue that, yeah, that the, this was sort of what happened in the 60s and 70s proved that the 50s were this sort of shallow Norman Vincent Peale, you know, everybody should be religious and I don't care what the religion is kind of kind of atmosphere. And I don't, I don't think that's right. I think that the, the, sh the cultural shifts driven not by individual actors, really, I mean, obviously somebody invented the birth control pill and, you know, somebody founded Playboy and so on, but like those individual actors, I think, were much less important than, you know, these deep trends that worked, their, worked themselves out in similar ways all across the developed West, right? There isn't sort of, I mean, the United States, Catholicism remained relatively robust compared to Quebec. France, you know, even even to some extent Southern Europe. And so I think it is, and this goes to your question about feminism, I try to focus less, I mean, I, I do talk about those issues, but I, I focus less on individual agents and more on just the idea that, you know, the sort of the sex, money, globalization, polarization stuff that I talk about, this was a big challenge. And this was a new, these were new challenges. I mean, they weren't completely new, but they, they were they were new. And it it isn't surprising that even seemingly potent institutions had a really tough time dealing with them. And that's part of why, you know, I'm obviously not wildly sympathetic towards a lot of liberal Christians in that period. And you know, some of my toughest reviews have come from liberal Protestants and liberal Catholics who who were alive in that era. But I think that I, I try to be fairly sympathetic to what some of them were thinking and doing because these were these were big challenges. You know, Christianity in 1967 was dealing with a new set of issues that the previous generation hadn't had to deal with. And people, I think the need to experiment, that felt need, even though many of the experiments were disastrous, and that felt need was real. And I think the fact that more conservative Christians haven't successfully reconstructed the culture of the 50s suggests that more was going on than just Hugh Hefner and Gloria Steinem and, you know, came along and, and tore it all down or something. So, so I'm trying, I do try and focus on those deep trends. And one of the trends that I don't focus on, um, and we'll, we'll end here with the insufficiency of my account, is those issues of science and technology that I, I certainly think play a big role um, in, certainly in the new atheism, right? That's obviously been sort of a, 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 a touchstone, a flashpoint, whatever word you want. But I think also have sort of weird sort of theological um, implications. Like, why is the idea of a bodily resurrection, right? Why is that idea less persuasive to people today if you're just judging by opinion polls? People who still believe in heaven, still believe in an afterlife, but are more likely to believe in a disembodied afterlife, less likely to believe traditional Christian teaching about the resurrection of the body. It clearly has something to do with scientific materialism. But it's sort of this weird paradox, right? Why does scientific materialism make a disembodied afterlife seem more plausible, and I'm not sure about the answer to that question. Um, and I think that 
I, I guess overall, I think the sort of the Christianity has become less appealing because more people believe in evolution or something. I, I think that's not really the big story of the last 50 years. I think the challenge from science was a bigger factor in the 19th century than it's been over the last uh, 50 years. But I think clearly, clearly those trends do have real some real impact, and it would probably take another book to, and somebody who actually knows more about science than I do, <clears throat> anyone in this room would care to volunteer, um, to really tackle, do them justice. So on that note, thank you guys so very much. Uh, thank you. That was really fun, that last four-question montage. I, I think we should do that more often, come up with creative ways, maybe just to challenge the speaker. We'll have you back. Think of something. Um, so thank you all for coming. Just a few quick notes. If, if you came and you're not on our event list, we'll, we'll be happy to add you at the desk out there. We have sheets of paper you can put your name. If you came, a friend recommended you to come. Because we have more book signings and excellent things like this that we'd love to, to keep you informed about. Also, if you like events like these, please don't hesitate to consider donating to the Catholic Information Center. You can see on our webpage, cicdc.org. We, uh, we are a nonprofit. It looks pretty swanky out there, and, and, I, and Ross delivers great speed, and we look like we're just brimming in, in all sorts of, you know, of wealth, I can imagine. But, but in reality, we are a nonprofit, and we only get, I think, a little less than 30% of our income from the book sales. So we very much appreciate donations, and thank you all, all of you for your support. And, and I lastly highly recommend you follow Ross's writing. If you haven't followed Ross Dothes' writing, you are totally missing out. Just on Sunday, there was a column, excellent column on eugenics, hit it out of the park. The next day, and this is a weekly, a weekly columnist, but two in, within two days, we get another excellent column, but this one on the blog, uh, on the New York Times blog that Ross writes for on gay marriage. I highly, highly recommend you read these two pieces, but also just can, you know, join the conversation. You look at the comments and it can get a little depressing. So just <laughs> <laughs> click like, share it with friends. I know, I know, I, I've tried to stop. So you, you just want to, you know, either pipe in a positive word, show that you support, that you're one of the voices is, you know, who support this, you're one of the people who support this great Catholic writer in the public square and Ross's voice. So share them. And also you're allowed to post a comment saying, you know, you hate me. Sure. <laughs> just share, just add some, just add a little variety. So we welcome you to do that as well. We hope you continue to, to, um, to read Ross's writing online, but first buy the book. And I disagree. It's, you didn't, you didn't get everything in this one talk. So I myself am taking the book home with me as well. So I hope we can remedy that for you if you don't have a book yet. So please join me in thanking Ross. Thank you.